listening to Mind Hacking, an Optimal Living interview with Sir John Hargrave and Brian Johnson. Hi, this is Brian. Welcome back to the Optimal Living interview series. Today, I'm thrilled to be chatting with Sir John Hargrave, who wrote Mind Hacking. He is an author, comedian, and entrepreneur, and author of this great book, Mind Hacking, subtitle, How to Change Your Mind for Good in 21 Days. Uh, one of our members recommended this book, and I absolutely loved it, as I was telling John before our chat. It's it's super, it's, it's grounded in science and neuroscience and, and just solid wisdom, and it applies it in a really fun, practical way, especially if you're a geek um, and into kind of computer hacking and that sort of thing. I think you'll really love the metaphors and the practical wisdom. John, thanks for taking the time. Thanks for having me, Brian. So uh, right before we jumped on, I asked you, uh, let's start with your name, Sir John. Uh, tell us about that. <laughs> Yeah, well, it's a funny story. I actually wrote the Queen of England several years back, and uh, I, I I asked her. I said, "Your Majesty, I would like to be knighted," because I just thought Sir John Hargrave sounded so much classier. Don't you, Brian? It's very classy. So the Queen actually wrote me back. I got a letter from Buckingham Palace, <laughs> no. and it said, uh, uh, "Well, to be knighted, you actually have to do something honorable." And I was like, "Well, that's a lot of work." So I called uh, my local county courthouse and I said, how do I get my name changed? And they said, well, you come down, you go before a judge, you pay a small fee and uh, you can you can have your name legally changed. So uh, so I did that. I went before the judge and here I am, uh, Sir John Hargrave before you today. It's kind of a name hack, if you will, but a, a lot easier than doing something noble and honorable, I'll tell you. Uh, as a British citizen, no less. That is awesome. Um, well, uh, that's fantastic. I was eager to hear your story on that. And uh, as as a comedian, my hunch was there was some story like that behind it. Um, the funny thing about it is, though, that once people start calling you Sir John Hargrave, you really do feel a responsibility to act more nobly and honorably. And I would say that it has significantly changed my life for the better because I really do want to live up to the name now it's on all my books and you know i i want to be sir worthy knight worthy if you will yeah that's awesome um and we'll talk about that too just in terms of how to hack our minds and to create the right circumstances to to change things in subtle and, and significant ways um let's start with the title of the book uh mind hacking tell us why you named the book mind hacking well the premise is that your brain can be reprogrammed your brain can be reprogrammed. And if you're willing to accept that premise, then then we show you how in this book. And, and a hack is really, it's uh, we use it in the original sense of the word, like a, a, a clever you know technique to solve a problem, like the early computer hackers, not malicious hacking, but, but, but genius hacking. And so mind hacking is about how can we find these techniques, these clever tricks to reprogram our own minds. Um, and I like calling the book a user manual for the mind. It's like the lost user manual. And so mind hacking is all about how can we, how can we change our mind like we're, we're reprogramming a computer. I love it. And can you, can you tell us the story that you started the book with about the challenges you were facing and kind of reaching a point where you're like, it's ready, it's, now's the time? <laughs> Yeah, so the book starts out with a great story, uh, which involves me being visited by the Secret Service. And I won't give away all the details, but let's suffice it to say when the Secret Service shows up on your doorstep, something's probably gone wrong <laughs> in your life, right? Like, that's not generally a good thing. So I realized, Brian, that, that my uh, alcoholism and, uh, and, and drug use was leading me to taking these crazy risks that, that culminated in the Secret Service showing up. And, and I made a decision that night, one of the worst nights of my life, that I was going to throw everything away. So I had all of these bottles of liquor. I said, I'm going to just go cold turkey, throw them in a dumpster. So I found myself behind the local supermarket throwing away bottle after bottle of, of expensive French wines and so forth. And I found that if, I, if, I, if my mind consciously focused on what I was doing, my mind would talk me out of it, right? Like it would say, what are you doing, you idiot? Think of all the good times we've had with this liquor. <laughs> you save it. Give it to a friend. And I knew that all those were kind of ways out. 
But I found that uh, if I just concentrated on the muscle movement of throwing away the bottles, like literally one step at a time, and kind of put my mind on hold, then I was able to get through it. And that was my first mind hack, if you will, was just focusing on that literally that one step at a time of throwing away uh, the bottles into this dumpster. And then, you know, getting sober and staying sober over the over the the months and years that followed, I started cataloging those hacks of how could I reprogram my mind to live a sober and healthy lifestyle. And I've been sober for uh, about nine years now, and it's been such an amazing journey that I wanted to share these hacks with other folks, um, regardless of whether you're wrestling with addiction or you're trying to achieve goals, you're trying to lose weight, you're trying to find a partner, you're trying to start a business. Mind hacking can be used for all those things. Yeah, that's awesome. It's super uh, funny story and super inspiring story. Um, and just your arc and, and uh, transparency in your challenges. And then look, this is what I did and what I do to stay on top of my game, which leads us to the next big idea I want to hear you describe, which is uh, Jedi-like concentration. One of the first chapters is called Developing Jedi-like Concentration. You have two facets to that that I thought was a perfect encapsulation of, of how to go about getting our minds right. Can you share that with us? Yeah, so Jedi concentration training is really all about uh, disciplining the mind. And there's kind of two two ways that you can think about your uh, attention. There's kind of like a top down and there's kind of a bottom up. And so, you know, the 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 top down is like let's let's train our minds to stay focused on a single task. And this is one of the great challenges of our digital age and of the current time that we live in is people are increasingly unable to stay focused on a single task. And so we have specific techniques in the book, what we call Jedi concentration training, um, similar to meditation that help you develop those powers of concentration. But the other piece is this bottom up where, you know, we call it being distracted by bright, shiny objects, right? So like I have a friend who we were uh, driving down the road one day and suddenly he just talk. He just screamed hawk, like right in the middle of this thought that he saw a hawk and that like just completely derailed his train of thought. So that's our our little catchphrase in our family is whenever anyone just has that sort of bottom up like interruption of concentration, we scream hawk. (laughs) So getting rid of those two is also part of this concentration. And again, the book has got a lot of really practical, fun exercises. We call them mind games to teach you to strengthen that top down as well as the bottom up concentration so you can actually get stuff done. Yeah, I love it. I'd love to hear if you could share some personal examples in terms of the reclaiming attention side of things. Like what are a few things that you do that you found really effective? Well, I think that uh, those of us who live digital lifestyles uh, have a particular problem because there's so many things fighting for your attention at, at, at any moment, right? And so one of these things is uh, the one hour investment, one of the mind games in the book. And it's basically like take one hour to consciously remove as many of those daily distractions as you can from your your digital workspace. So examples would be things like, you know, the little uh, system updates that appear in the tray uh, of your computer or the email list that you're on that you don't need to be on or you know, setting your text messages to vibrate instead of that annoying audible alert. All of those things are like, they're they're like attention stealers. And what they do is they distract us from the purpose at hand. And, you know, it's in uh, the best interest of these, you know, of device and software manufacturers to interrupt us. So we use their their devices and their software. And you've really got to reclaim that. You got to say, listen, I'm going to clean out all of this stuff so that I can actually focus and be productive and get my mind to where I want it to go. So we, we, we basically say one hour to clean all those up is an investment that will pay off uh, for many, many hours in the future. That's great. And I just wrote down systems upgrade messages, turn that off. Um, yes. It's a subtle thing. You know, like I've done a lot of work to get off the iPhone and out of email and all that stuff to systematically do it but continuing to find those little marginal gains that make a significant difference when they're aggregated and then compounded, right? Yeah. Um, And then meditation, uh, you call them mind games as a key facet to retrain our concentration. You got a bunch of hilarious 
um, ways to approach it. <laughs> uh, the alien <laughs> blasters, uh, I forget what you call it, the other one, third nipple or something funny like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what's your favorite one? Well, my basic uh, meditation exercise, I, I you know, I, I think it's more important to do it than to worry about the technique. It's kind of like exercise. Like it's the most important thing is just to do it. But the way I recommend people who don't have a meditation practice is just make time to do it. 20 minutes in the morning is what I do. And I spend the first few minutes just relaxing every part of the body, starting with the, the head going down to the toes. And then uh, focusing on the breath. So focusing on the breath at the nostrils. And this to me is sort of the, the meditation 101. If this is all you learn, focus on the breath. When you notice your mind uh, wandering, bring it back and reward yourself with what we call awareness points. So we kind of gamify meditation. And the idea is that with normal meditation, people, they find their mind wandering, which is normal, and then they get frustrated and they say, I can't keep my mind focused. Well, nobody can keep their mind focused. That's what you're practicing with meditation. But when you gamify it and you say, I get a reward every time I notice my mind wandering and I return it back to the, the breath, then you give yourself a little dopamine hit, right? It's like a little burst of pleasure for noticing that. And that is the point of meditation is noticing the mind wandering. Mm. So you do that for 20 minutes every morning. And, uh, you know, like exercise, over time, you will notice huge gains in your in your concentration, uh, in your health, in your relationships. It really permeates every aspect of life. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, that's precisely what I do, the 20 minutes. And um, again, I just love the way you frame it. You also have this funny line where you say, you give yourself a pre-mind game pep talk and you say, I'm going to quote you now, mentally tell yourself what you're going to do. For example, for the next 20 minutes, I will focus on the breath so that I may develop superhuman concentration and just make it fun, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. But it helps. Like it yeah. really helps to say, here's like really make a commitment to yourself and say, I'm going to do it. What is your technique, Brian? I'm curious. You said you spend 20 minutes in the morning. Yeah, it's very similar. And I, I actually taught a class called Meditation 101 where we talked about exactly that. And one of my number one things that I share when I teach it is just do it. Like it's way more important to show up and do yeah. it than it is to yeah. do it perfectly or to do the particular technique or whatever. Um, and don't miss a day. So that's my number one thing. I've missed one day in the last nine eight nine years or something like that now amazing and i literally it was after like three years and i went through like these stages of grief the morning after i realized i broke the streak uh, <laughs> <laughs> but but anyway that's my thing and it's always first thing in the morning right after i wake up and do the morning stuff it's it's sit 20 minutes and i sit in a basic posture um i take five deep breaths inhaling to six holding for two exhaling for eight um every single time just five breaths and then I'll vary it. You know, I'll do different things. Um, often it's it's counting, you know, my breaths deeply, one to 10, one to 10, um, seeing how few I can get, making it a game that way. Uh, but for me, it's, it's more of just an awesome opportunity to sit, be present, be grounded, um, kind of feel that sense of spaciousness too in time and prioritization, yeah. while obviously just getting my mind just a little bit sharper, a little bit sharper, a little bit sharper, and letting those little drops add up. Um, and I can't imagine who I was before I started doing this. There's no question it's been extraordinary for me to develop that top-down um, focusing ability. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And I think your whole point about the streaks is really important because I've taught a ton of people meditation as well. And, and the, the thing that I think most people get frustrated with is, you know, I'm not seeing any, re I've been doing this for three days and I'm not seeing any results. It's still difficult for me. But you do, it does take time, like exercise, it yeah. takes time, but once you start seeing the results, they're phenomenal. Yeah, and as you say in the book, and as we all know at this stage, the research is unequivocal. I mean, it's literally yeah. the equivalent of going to the gym and working out your muscles. And you're not gonna change that uh, in, in one workout or 50 push-ups later, right? It's the diligently, patiently, persistently showing up. Um, so, Love it. Next idea, debugging your mind, another great metaphor that you talk about. Um, tell us about that. Well, basically, we, we use the analogy of, of, uh, of loops in programming. So if you've ever done any coding, you know, a lot of what you do is, is looping through tasks. And our minds are the same way, that we have loops. And they can be positive loops or negative loops. And the negative loops, part of what we're doing in meditation is to become aware of those negative loops. And the negative loops are things like, you know, I'm not smart enough or I can't do this or I'll never find true love or I can't lose this weight 
whatever those things are that we routinely tell ourselves, we tend to believe whatever our mind says. So whatever those negative loops that are going on in our head, we tend to just believe it without questioning. And one of the great freedoms you get with meditation as you develop this concentration training is you realize like you don't have to believe everything you think. You don't have to believe everything your mind tells you. And so then you start to say, well, listen, I can now see this. I have this perspective because I've been practicing this every day during meditation, practicing seeing my mind when it wanders. I now have this perspective of being able to step back and say, this thing that I routinely think about myself, this negative loop, I don't have to think that anymore. I actually could reprogram that and turn it into something better. So we've got a ton of exercises or mind games that you can play to identify those negative loops that are holding you back and keeping you from your your goals and your dreams, and then to reprogram those with the positive equivalent of those uh, loops. We call it debugging the mind. Yeah, I love it. Are you open to sharing one of your own little processes, kind of the negative uh, to positive? <laughs> Yeah. So a good example is, you know, I used to think uh, I was no good with people. So I would, you know, I'd be talking with somebody and, and I would feel really self-conscious and awkward. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd be thinking internally, like, you know, am I standing up straight or do I smell or is there a piece of kale in my teeth? And uh, then I realized at one point that, like, you know, this is a negative thought loop. I'm no good with people. And so I asked, what is the positive equivalent? Well, the positive equivalent is I'm good with people. You know, I'm comfortable talking with folks. I have great relationships, et cetera. So I just started repeating that whenever I noticed my mind going into that negative spiral as I was talking with somebody. And I did that, you know, thousands of times. And over time, it turns out that, uh, guess what? I actually am kind of good with people now. So there's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy to all this, that when you start to repeat those positive loops to yourself, they really do start to become true because they are your new reality. That's the magic of this. Hmm. That's awesome. And it kind of goes back to your Sir John, right? There's a level of that uh, self-image you're living up to and into. Yeah, yeah. It's I, I, I am slowly but surely becoming a knight <laughs> or someone who is knight-worthy. Right on. Um, so let's, let's go to, to the next idea, which is tied to that, which is the research you talk about regarding imagining your best self in 10 years. Can you talk to us about that? Yeah, there's a, a lot of uh, fun mind games in the book about figuring out what it is you want. And I think that's the problem that most of us have is, you know, if you ask the average person, what is it that you want? <laughs> They'll kind of look at you and say, you know, like uh, a pony. You know, like n nobody's really that sure. Like we all know what we don't want. That's very easy. We're always complaining about those things. But figuring out what it is that you want is the real challenge. And so these mind games in the book basically are about how can you like they help you visualize what is it that what is it that you want to be or become or do in your life. Um, you know, one of them is called the uh, the funeral speech. <laughs> so. The, the game is basically to imagine your funeral. And uh, on that day, what is it that you want people to say about you? The eulogy virtues, if you will. You know, not what you've accomplished, but the kind of person that you want to be in your life. And by imagining that, you know, you can start to see these are these are the things that I want people to say about me when I'm gone. And that is a great way of, of figuring out the, the virtues that you want to embody in your life. And those in turn can be turned into those positive loops that you repeat to yourself and, and slowly reprogram your mind to, uh, to obtain. That's awesome. And I want to talk about virtues in our next um, idea with Ben Franklin and his moral perfection project. Um, and then to go back to the 10 years, just to underscore, because you talk about the research so nicely about Laura King and the work that she did of just imagining your best self in 10 years, just doing that boosts your overall optimism and uh, well-being and mood. Um, so taking the time to actually flex that muscle and get clear on, well, what do you want? What does your ideal look like in 10 years? Um, in and of itself, before you even do anything, actually boosts everything you want to boost, right? Yeah, that research is really great. And writing it down, too, is an mm. important piece. So if 
you know, in in the tet in the uh, in the research, it was basically like journal for a few minutes each day on what your best self looks like. And mm. when people wrote down that vision of themselves, their best selves in ten years, they were significantly happier, more optimistic, more positive, and by the way, more prepared to actually become that person and you know live into that that dream. I'm going to quote you again. Um, I love that. And you have this great line in the book. You say, I challenge you to spend the next five minutes picturing what you want your life to look like in 10 years. If you can't invest five minutes thinking about what you want to become, you have to seriously question your priorities. (laughs) These five minutes could mean the difference between a life of confusion and sorrow and a life of happiness and fulfillment. What could be more important than that? So um, let's all remember to take the five minutes. Press pause right now if you can and take three to five minutes and just reflect on what you want your life to look like in 10 years. Super simple, super powerful little hack. Um, let's go back to virtues and specifically Ben Franklin and his project. Can you tell us about that? Ben Franklin, one of my heroes, had this, uh, called it the Moral Perfection Project. He writes about it in his autobiography. And basically, he made a list of 13 virtues uh, that he wanted to embody. And he wrote them down in a little notebook with a little grid. And every day, he would grade himself uh, on these virtues. And basically he said, I, I, I was surprised to find myself much fuller of faults than I imagined, but I had the satisfaction of seeing them diminish. <laughs> so basically he would, you know, think he would have, uh, virtues like uh, cleanliness and, and industry and, uh, chastity and things like that. And I've made a list of my own virtues uh, several years ago, and I review those every morning. I have them in a text file on my computer. And, you know, before I start my workday, I just look through those and just remind myself of them. It takes 30 seconds. And yet, again, just like being called Sir John Hargrave, over the years, I've found while I am far from perfect <laughs> and I'm much fuller of faults than I imagine, I have had the satisfaction of seeing myself slowly move in that direction and seeing those virtues become part of of my life and so going back to envisioning your best self you know figuring out what those virtues are that you want your life to embody and then reminding yourself and making a system that reminds you of them on a daily basis uh, I think one of the most important things you can do in life. Yeah, I completely agree. And I love the phrase you used of the eulogy virtues. And I'm actually looking at, I put mine on an index card. So I've got six virtues that I aspire to embody for, from like a creative and professional perspective. Yeah. And then I flip the side, which frankly I need to flip more often because I keep the work side up <laughs> more <laughs> often, you know, then the other side is the family. What are the virtues that I want to embody um, that I hope, you know, my family is proud to say I embodied at the end of my life in that eulogy scenario. Um, and it's unbelievably powerful just to have those on my desk all the time, check them out throughout the day. 10 seconds, right? It's not a big deal, but those little reminders are, are truly significant. There's a, a great book that I just read recently called The Road to Character by David Brooks. I was just going to mention that when because he's the one who introduced me to the idea of eulogy virtues. But Yeah, continue. that's where I got that from too. So, you know, he talks about there's, there's the resume virtues versus the eulogy virtues. And the idea is resume virtues are all the things you've accomplished, success in typical terms, but eulogy virtues are the things people are going to say about you after you die. And they're kind of two different things. And they really, we, what we will try, want to try to do is live lives that, that accomplish both. Uh, but those eulogy virtues, he, he, he makes character studies of all these uh, famous leaders throughout history and, and says, here's how they developed some of those virtues. And what I appreciated about his book was there, he really gives you an idea that it's messy, like life is messy and nobody is perfect and nobody embodies those uh, w- with with perfection. And yet, you know, we we still can strive for those things and make significant progress toward them. And that's so much of what mind hacking is about is it really is about improvement in the direction of those virtues. That's awesome. Uh, it reminds me of Stephen Covey's um, primary greatness as well, where, you know, it's primary greatness, focus on these virtues and let the secondary greatness, which most of society is all about the resume virtues come as a byproduct of your commitment to, to these virtues and something bigger than yourself. And, and, uh, 
such a powerful frame. I love uh, the Road to Character. Highly recommend that for anyone interested in di- diving deeper in that realm. Um, for now, let's come back to another one of my favorite mind hacks and it's kind of stories you shared was on Pete Carroll and him working with his his partner, Dr. Michael Gervais, the sports psychologist. And I just love that line you shared of, what do you say we build a masterpiece together? Can you tell us a little mm. bit about what they did and how they integrated mind hacking? Yeah, I heard Michael Gervais, the sports psychologist who was behind the Seattle Seahawks and their amazing Super Bowl victory. And uh, it was so inspiring. And he he talks about how he works with players in high stress situations. And he really gives you this appreciation for professional football how it, I am, you know, the 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 physical danger that they're in, as well as the constant emotional danger, you know, the thought that you're going to miss one play and you're going to be eviscerated by the press and that people are have made like m- huge monetary bets on the outcome of the game. And all of these things are riding on your performance at any given moment. And he says when he works with players and how he really coached the Seahawks team was in encouraging this this mind hacking approach of let's figure out what it looks like when you're at your best. So in other words, he gets those players into the zone, into the mental zone when they have been, you know, in the flow, when they've been most at the at, at their peak performance. And then he says, how are we going to get you there in those moments of extreme stress? How, what are the tools or techniques that you're going to use, the hacks, we might say, to get yourself back into that zone when you are under extreme stress? And that's what they do together. And, you know, obviously it, it worked, <laughs> but, you know, meditation was a, a huge part of that. And, and just the mental game of understanding how you personally can get there. And, you know, I think all of us, for example, I'm, you know, I run this content marketing business, Media Shower. I would be in a high stakes situation speaking in front of a big audience or with, you know, an important customer, whatever that might be. There are moments when we all have stress, when we all have those situations and we've got to learn how to get ourselves into that 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 zone of peak performance that's that's what mind hacking is all about i love it and then you know what gets in the way so seeing yourself at the best and then what gets in the way what is your kryptonite what are the thoughts what are the behaviors you engage in uh that gets in the way of you actually consistently showing up at that that peak spot and then hack your way through that right <laughs> get creative and figure out a way to more consistently move move around that and through it etc uh what do we not talk about is there like a favorite idea that we didn't talk about that you want to you want to share well i love talking about the reality distortion field that's the uh comes from steve jobs um who his co-workers explained they described Jobs as having this reality distortion field, and, and there's this story about a uh, w- one of the new programmers on the original Macintosh. A uh, new guy came came into the team, and uh, one of the veteran programmers pulls him aside just before a meeting with Jobs, and he says, I just want to warn you, before you go into this room, Jobs is going to want this uh, shipped in 10 weeks. And the new programmer says, that's, that's impossible. We can't do it. And the veteran says, I, I understand that, but you're going to have to understand that Steve Jobs has a reality distortion field. And so the new programmer goes in there and he comes out an hour later, totally convinced that he can do it. And the idea was that Jobs had this belief that things were possible that was so strong that he could actually influence the minds of others. And I believe that all of us have within us that reality distortion field. We have the power to do that. And it comes from this this conviction that we absolutely can and will get something done, that we will make this reality a reality. And when we believe in that strongly enough ourselves, we actually have the power to influence the minds of others. With most of us, it's, it's a very weak gravitational pull. But with with concentration, with practice, we can learn to build up that reality distortion field and and use it to make great changes in the world. I love it. One little mind hack at a time. Uh, This is great. I love to. to, I'm going to share your your URL in a moment, and people can connect with you more deeply. Um, But I like to wrap up these interviews by asking one final question, which is: 
if you, from what you've learned and, and integrated and, and all that good stuff, had to share just one piece of wisdom for an individual passionate about optimizing their life, what would that one piece of wisdom be? I think that your brain can be reprogrammed. Your brain can be reprogrammed. So you do not have to accept the way that your mind thinks today. You are the master of your mind. You control it. You own it. And so therefore, you can get down deep into the source code and you can reprogram it to think anything that you want, literally anything you want. That's how you unleash your potential as a magnificent human being. Love it. Thank you, Sir John. Uh, where can people go to learn more about you and mind hacking? Well, you can uh, buy the book on Amazon or at fine booksellers everywhere. And you can also uh, visit www.mindhacky.ng. So that's mind hacking with a dot ng. And subscribe to our email list where you actually get a full 21 day program of guided uh, exercises. So you can learn meditation and uh, actually have guided exercises that walk you through all the mind games we've been talking about, Brian. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for your work and for taking the time. Thanks, Brian. Isn't it a bit odd that we went from math to science to history, but somehow missed the class on how to live? For some wacky reason, Optimal Living 101 never made the schedule. Of course, it's too late to go back and change that, and you're too busy to read full time to catch up. Yet, if you're like us, you're all about optimizing your life and actualizing your potential. So imagine this. Imagine having someone read the best books on optimal living and pulling out the big ideas that can truly change your life. You know, those sections you asterisk and underline and mark all up. Then imagine that guy, me, connecting those ideas to other great books and helping you apply them to your life today. Well, that's what I do with something we call Philosopher's Notes, where I break down each great book into a simple six-page PDF, 20-minute MP3, and 10-minute Philosopher's Notes TV episode. Then imagine me taking the absolute best big ideas from those great books and sharing them with you in fun, inspiring, super practical, optimal living 101 classes. On stuff like Purpose 101, Confidence 101, Business 101, Meditation 101, that sort of thing. You got a personal trainer? I'm kind of like your personal philosopher. Ancient wisdom plus modern science plus common sense plus virtue plus mastery plus fun. That's what our optimized membership program is all about. We'd love to have you join us. Check us out at brianjohnson.me slash join.